Great. Also, thanks for inviting me, and thanks for putting together such a great session. Really happy to be here. <coughs> hmm. ah, that's better. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so I've got nothing to disclose. Uh, so laminar fMRI is the study of um, intracortical uh, activation patterns with the goal of detecting distinct activation within individual cortical layers, and it's an emerging application of high-resolution fMRI. So why are we interested in the fMRI of cortical layers? Well, from animal studies, we know that several cortical layers have distinct functional roles, and therefore laminar fMRI is going to be necessary in order to map functional architecture within humans as well. This also provides us with a nice test bed for investigating the limits of fMRI, and this really appeals to engineers and physicists. It's really an extension of the previous program uh, to understand the neural specificity of fMRI by detecting the layout of cortical columns, and it's also a technology driver. What's good for laminar fMRI, I think, is good for fMRI in general. Uh, any improvements we make in neural specificity for laminar fMRI can be useful for conventional fMRI as well. Also, there are known anatomical patterns of feed-forward and feedback pathways that are segregated across layers, and so if we can identify which layers are being activated, we may be able to uh, decipher brain circuitry, which of course is very important for understanding brain function. So why an educational talk on this topic? Well, it's a relatively new field. It's been enabled by increasing availability of smallpox and fMRI, but it's also very challenging from a data analysis standpoint. Uh, so today, individual cortical layers really can't be resolved with current fMRI techniques, and so we need strategies in order to try to localize activity within individual cortical layers. Conventional analysis approaches really are not appropriate. In fact, I'm giving an entire talk in this uh, Tuesday member-initiated symposium all on the analysis of laminar fMRI data. But also there are some major interpretational challenges. We know that there's hemodynamic coupling and spreading across the layers. It's still not known whether or not blood flow regulation in the brain is kind of specific enough to give rise to focal blood flow uh, changes in response to neural activity within individual layers. That's a big issue. Also, the functional organization of layers is largely unknown. So currently there are some conventional invasive electrophysiology studies and kind of conventional neuroscience that are ongoing, which are looking into the functional properties of the layer. So currently, there's a lack of ground truth. But this also means it's kind of exciting. It's an opportunity for us to learn something new about the brain. So with that kind of brief introduction, I'd like to give a quick uh, outline. So first, I'll review the anatomy of cortical layers and ask, how closely do the various anatomical and functional definitions agree? Uh, next, I'll talk a little bit about how to analyze laminar fMRI data and ask, how do we identify signals from specific cortical layers? Uh, then I'll say a few words about the interpretation of laminar fMRI signals and ask how, how non-uniform and how coupled are these hemodynamic signals across the layers. And finally, I'm just going to give a few words on some challenges in predicting neuronal responses across layers and ask, can we infer feed-forward and feedback pathways uh, through localizing activity through laminar fMRI. So first, a few words on the anatomy. So as many of you know, cerebral cortex, cortex is Latin for bark. Most of this bark is neocortex, which is evolutionarily the most recent, and it comprises esocortex cortex with six main layers with a rough common layout across the brain. Now the rest of the bark is allocortex or other cortex, which has fewer than six layers, such as paleocortex, for example, the olfactory cortex, which is three-layered, archicortex, which is evolutionarily most oldest, such as the four-layered hippocampus, and a couple of other cortices at the transitions between these guys. But even though the esocortex, which is the part that we're interested in mostly, has this rough common layout across the, across the brain, we see that there are some regional differences in esocortex as well, such as in this example, you can see that uh, motor cortex has no layer four. So it's these regional differences in the laminar anatomy across the esocortex that allow us to distinguish or define cortical areas based on their laminar anatomy. So there are several anatomical definitions of the layers in the esocortex based on both cytoarchic tectonic and myeloarchic tectonic features. Cyto features such as cell density and cell size, myeloarchic tectonic such as myelin content and fiber orientation. We typically define the granular layers, layer four, this is where the small granular cells are located. Above that are the supergranular layers, and below that are the infragranular layers. So while esocortex has this sort of rough common layout across most of the brain, there's many sublayers as well. Uh, you can see them here. The sublayers can be defined based on uh, uh, their cytoarchitonic or myeloarchitonic features. And I've heard it said that uh, six-layered esocortex is a bit of a unicorn. The number of layers that can be distinguished really varies a lot between areas uh, and differs between different histological stains. And what that means is that for any given cortical area, any given esocortical area, there's really, you're going to be very unlikely to see only six layers. There's many different sublayers as well. 
So we also know that there's varying thickness of the cortical layers across areas. Here's some example from some primary sensory and motor areas. Again, motor cortex has no layer four. We see this. We see that this indicates that the layers really shift around a lot across the brain, even between adjacent areas like V1 and V2. Also note here that the thickest layers are around 500 microns. So what this means is that in order to resolve activity within these layers, we would need voxels of about you know, 200 microns in size. And that's still not really achievable. So today in laminar fMRI, we very rarely, if ever, fully resolve the layers. And that's an important point to keep in mind. So if I normalize these thicknesses by the cortical thickness, we can see again that some of these layers really occupy very large percentages in certain areas and not in others. So for example, it, layer four is really pronounced in V1, and this could be cause of a sampling bias in our laminar fMRI. We might be getting more signal from layer four than from the other layers, for example, in V1. Now we know that there are distinct functional roles of the cortical sublayers as well. For example, in V1, we typically sub, uh, subdivide layer four into four sublayers, 4A, 4B, 4C alpha, which is a magnocellular pathway, which is responsible for processing motion and depth. Uh, they are 4C beta, which is on the parvocellular pathway that's responsible for processing form and colors. Very two different functional properties on these very adjacent cortical layers. Also note that layers two and layer three tend to have sort of similar functional roles. So we typically lump them together into layer two, three in the visual cortex. Now with other cortical regions, people tend to subdivide in different ways. For example, in motor cortex, people tend to distinguish between layer 5A and layer 5B. Here's another example of this basic layout in visual cortex. You should note that there's something that's missing from both of these diagrams. Uh, there's no layer one. That's because layer one tends to be very cell sparse. It's a lot, lot of horizontal fibers. It's almost like a copy of the white matter. And therefore, layer one has a very limited functional role and is often omitted from these functional diagrams. So perhaps the best known feature of cortical layers is that many of the layers are sites of inputs and outputs along various feed forward feedback and horizontal pathways. Many look to this uh, seminal paper by Fellman and Vanessen for the basic scheme. They did a meta-analysis in this paper and they, based on the fact that people could distinguish based on the termination patterns of the projections across areas, whether they were feed forward or feedback in nature. So they defined here uh, pathways that were ascending or feed forward where the outputs were superlaminar or bilaminar and the projections were to layer four. They also defined a lateral or horizontal pathways in which the outputs were bilaminar and the terminations were columnar. They also defined uh, descending or feedback pathways in which the outputs were infragranular or bilaminar and the terminations were multilaminar. Now, just like the cytoarchitectonics and myeloarchitectonics vary a lot across areas, so do the angioarchitectonics. We know that they vary a lot across layers and also across areas. So in the seminal paper from Duvernoy to find uh, six intracortical arterial types, five intracortical venule types, but also four vascular layers. For example, here's vascular layer three. It's the site of the highest capillary density, kind of overlaps with uh, layer four and a little bit of layer three and five. But it also, we see that these angioarchitectonics also vary across areas. For example, this is a nice uh, example here. You can see, just to orient you, here's the calcarin sulcus. Uh, there's the white matter. You can see that the high capillary density in vascular layer three ends abruptly at the V1, V2 boundary. You can almost find the boundary based on looking at this, this change in the capillary density. We've seen this in other cortical regions as well. So the vascular density can really vary a lot across the brain. So next, a few words on laminar analysis. So typically, laminar analysis, our first step is to sample the functional activity across cortical depths. And so we need to take into account the different kind of levels of the intercortical vascular anatomy. We know that we have these large draining veins that drain deoxygenated blood from large cortical domains. We also have these diving venules that penetrate perpendicularly into the cortex. This can be the cause of some laminar coupling of the signals. So we'll talk more about that later. And of course, we have the randomly oriented dense capillary bed here in the parenchyma. We've already seen how the capillary density can vary a lot across cortical depths. So these fMRI signals across layers are sampling from different levels of the vascular hierarchy. And of course, we need to take this into account in our analysis. So again, the first step is to perform a cortical depth analysis. One way to do that is with what, what I call a surface-based depth analysis, and we generate a family of cortical surfaces across the depths. Here's an example of the cross-sections of those surfaces overlaid on top of an MPRH. And in the analysis, we simply identify our fMRI voxels to intersect each of these surfaces. So in this surface-based cortical depth analysis, we generate one surface model per depth. This gives us a laminar analysis for large expanses of folded cortex, We're no longer restricted to locally flat patches of tissue. So in a demonstration of this type of analysis, we looked at the cortical depth dependence of spatial accuracy and gradient echo bold. So we, here we generated a retinotopic stimulus that was designed to activate uh, uh, in visual cortex in the shape of this letter M, and we observed the pattern of activity. We saw was that when we measured the activity near to the white matter surface, the spatial fidelity was pretty good. But as we progressively sampled across cortical depths, slowly up towards the peel surface, we saw that the spatial fidelity of this pattern broke down systematically. And I think in an interesting way, this is one of my favorite artifacts. It looks 
looks like there might be a peel vessel that's cutting off the top corner of the M here. So this, well, this nicely illustrates for us, you know, in a very kind of easy to understand fashion, that there really is a very strong depth dependence on the vascular contribution of Bolt. And we also looked at the signal changes as a function of cortical depth. What we saw was that the signal changes near to the white matter, about a 1.5% signal change, whereas near to the peel surface, we saw twice that, about a 3% signal change. And this sort of trend towards seeing stronger signal changes near to the peel surface has been seen by many groups now. Again, it's another evidence that there's different vascular contributions to the bold signal across depths. Now, with this uh, surface-based cortical depth analysis, there's one disadvantage. If we consider our voxel grid, any one voxel might be assigned to multiple cortical depths. Now, this analysis is really nice for looking at 2D patterns as a function of depth, but for looking at laminar profiles, there's some disadvantages. So we can just do away with these intracortical surfaces. Instead, we can compute the centroid of every voxel in three dimensions and simply calculate the distance between that centroid and the bounding surfaces of the cortex in order to assign uh, this voxel a cortical depth. So here are some examples of the surface-based cortical depth profiles and the voxel-based cortical depth profiles. Depth profiles. <laughs> uh, this is actually a fun experiment. We looked at the uh, physiological noise across depth. In a previous slide, I showed you that the signal levels increased as we sample close to the peel surface. What this is showing is that the noise, sadly, also increases as we sample close to the peel surface. So the blue curve here, this is the percent uh, variance explained from this retro i -core regressor, which is, includes a cardiac and respiratory components. You can see from the laminar profile generated from this surface-based depth analysis, we can see this slow increase in the physiological noise levels as we sample close to the peel surface. But it's a little bit kind of smoothed out in the depth dimension because we're using this surface-based approach. If you consider on the right this voxel-based cortical depth definition, we can see this more details in this laminar profile. You can see the transition in this physiological noise between regions where we're more dominated by the white matter and regions where we're more dominated by the physiological noise at the peel surface. So this tends to smooth out the profiles less. So one of the assumptions that we make when we generate these laminar profiles is that all of the voxels within an ROI that we pool together to generate this profile have the same activity. And that's a kind of a strong assumption. So there's a natural inclination to make this ROI as small as possible. But the problem is that if the ROI is too small, it can introduce a sampling bias across depths. So for example, here's a very small ROI. Maybe it's tough to see. There it is. If we look at the depths that are sampled by all the voxels in this ROI, what we find is that some depths are sort of more represented than others. You can see in this histogram, in this one example, we're getting a lot more samples from the peel surface, which is going to bias our analysis. So if we make the ROI a little bit bigger and look at the histogram again, we see that a larger ROI kind of samples more evenly across cortical depths. And if we make the ROI a little bit even bigger, we see much more uniform sampling pattern across depths to eliminate this source of bias. So the point is, with laminar fMRI, there's this trick between, you know, you want your ROI to be small enough so that the assumption that all the activity within the ROI is the same is met, and also not too small that you introduce these sampling biases. Now, we also know that layer positions and thicknesses vary with the folding pattern. It's been seen you know, in classic anatomical studies that in gyri, the lower layers are expanded. In sulci, the upper layers are expanded. And what this means is that in gyri, layer four is sort of pulled up towards the cortical surface. In sulci, it's sort of stretched down towards uh, the white matter surface. So this acts to exaggerate uh, the geometry of layer four. Now, it was proposed about 100 years ago or so from Bach that there might be some volume preservation principle or equivolume principle that might be employed in order to predict the positions of these layers as a function of the folding pattern to account for this finding. And recently, the Leipzig group implemented this technique, this equivolume principle, in order to, to predict layer position. So they started with this sort of classic Laplace solution, kind of, which kind of minimizes the geometry of layer four. They predicted the location of layer four and tested whether it matched layer four that they could see in their high resolution ex vivo data. And they saw that the that Laplace equation didn't do a great job at predicting the location of layer four. They next used an equidistant approach, which places layer four at a constant depth, so it doesn't really vary as a function of the folding pattern. They saw that it did a pretty good job, but still it was missing layer four in the data in a couple of places. Whereas this equivolume approach, which is anatomically inspired, uh, provided the best estimation of the location of layer four. And it's this approach that's actually used today in the majority of laminar fMRI studies. So this group later on went on to say that if you have relatively large voxels, the difference between this equidistant approach and equivolume approach might be kind of subtle. The equivolume approach really performs best when you go to smaller and smaller voxels, where the differences between these two approaches become more um, accentuated. So here's a nice movie given, me to, by, um, given to me by Renzo Hooper, kind of showing the difference between the equidistant and equivalent predictions. What's nice in this movie, sort of toggling back and forth between the two, you see that the two predictions differ most in regions where the cortex is very highly folded. Okay, so next, some interpretation. 
So in order to interpret the fMRI signal, we need to take into account how the vasculature and the hemodynamics vary across depths. We've already seen that the bold signal varies systematically across depth, but what we're also seeing now is that blood flow regulation also appears to be a function of the vascular hierarchy. This is demonstrated nicely by Anna DeVore's group, looking at two-photon microscopy, the dilation of individual arterioles in response to neural activity. What they found was that the deep arterioles actually dilated before the superficial. So what this means is that the deep arterioles sort of dilate first in response to activity, and there's this upstream propagation of dilation up to the peel surface. So what they sh sh saw here was that both the time to peak of this arteriolar dilation and the onset time both decreased systematically with cortical depth, telling us that there's a cortical depth dependence on the timing of blood flow regulation. Now the same group went back and looked at the bolt response as a function of cortical depth. What they found was that both the amplitude and shape of the bolt response also vary systematically across depths. You can see from these curves on the right. For example, this red curve corresponds to the bolt signal measured near to the peel surface. Not only did they see this very pronounced sort of a post-stimulus undershoot at the surface, but they also could see some evidence for a robust initial dip only at voxel sampling from the, from the peel surface. So they suggested that this differing bolt signal across depths reflected the spatial gradient of the microvascular their dilation device that I showed you in the previous slide. Now, this varying hemodynamic response has been shown across depths in human fMRI as well from the Utrecht group. Both in the trial responses and the deconvolved HRF and visual cortex, they saw that both the amplitude and shape of, of the, the bold response varied as a function of cortical depth. And again, they seem to see in this one example in the bold signals measured near to the PL surface also some little evidence of an initial dip. So what this means is that the HRF is changing across depths. So, and so if you perform an fMRI analysis using some canonical HRF, the same HRF across all depths, this is going to introduce a detection bias because you're going to be more likely to see activations in the cortical depths that happen to have an HRF that match your model. So this is another important uh, source of bias. Now, a few words on the laminar specificity of bold and non-bold fMRI. So this is work from Sanjay Kim's group looking at the visual cortex in cats. They looked at the gradient echo signal and also the spinnacle signal. What they found was that there's a peak gradient echo bolt signal around large vessels and a peak spinnacle bolt signal around the, the parenchyma or microvasculature. And as we heard in the previous talk, this is to be expected. This is at high fields. So most of the bolt signal is extravascular. And so it's known that the spinnacle signal is preferentially sensitive to extravascular signal changes around the microvasculature. So this is a nice demonstration, but they also looked at the CPV-weighted response using both a gradient echo and spin echo readout. What they saw was that the CPV-weighted signal was also nicely localized to the parenchyma. In this case, they used a blood pool contrast agent, uh, myon. And because they were using myon, the large vessel signal is really reduced near to the surface uh, by these pronounced dephasing effects that are associated with this contrast agent. But they're a little bit concerned here that maybe these large CPV changes in the parenchyma could reflect uh, the fact that there was a higher microvascular density in the parenchyma. So what they did next is they normalized the CPV weighted signal by the baseline CPV signal in order to account for the fact that there's differing uh, microvascular densities across depths. This is sort of a percent signal change. And what they found was that this percent signal change CPV was still localized uh, to the parenchyma. Now, other groups are seeing the local peaks in the bold activation around layer 4 and V1 in response to a flashing checkerboard, both in macaque V1 and in human V1. And both of these groups did a, performed a vein removal analysis. So on the, on the left, what they did was they identified voxels that had a very large percent signal change, tagged those as uh, veins, and removed them. After removing them, you can see a much more pronounced peak in layer 4. Uh, the group on the right, what they did was they sort of explicitly measured the peel, uh, the venous vasculature using an anatomical scan, and identified bold voxels near to those peel vessels and removed them to basically be able to better see this peak in layer 4. So this is kind of a puzzling finding because it's, uh, we don't typically think of flashing checkerboards as giving rise to differential activity across cortical layers. So this peak in layer 4 may reflect increased metabolic rate there, increased cell density, maybe increased vascular density. It's not really known, but I think this is kind of a fundamental question about now that we're starting to think about how neuronal density might relate to the bolt signal. This is, we're thinking about this for the first time here in, in the context of laminar fMRI. So one way in which we can potentially avoid these biases is through experimental design. I like this example using different stimulus conditions in order to understand the sources of bias. So in this case, this is, again, work by Renzo. He was looking at uh, laminar analysis and motor cortex using CPV. He looked at finger tapping with touch, finger tapping without touch, touch only, and it's lateral tapping. What he found was that in response to each of these different stimuli, very different profiles. So these multiple distinct profiles were elicited from the same cortical region, which really helps to argue against the profile reflecting any underlying bias uh, to any one depth. And I think this is a very nice analysis.
So probably the central question of laminar from Rye is uh, whether or not the blood flow re regulation is really controlled at a fine enough spatial scale to give rise to local responses within individual cortical layers. An equivalent question is, where are the control structures? Now, it's well known that there's smooth muscle cells only around the uh, arterioles. And therefore, for a long time, it was believed that the ultimate spatial specificity of fMRI was going to be limited by the spacing of these arterioles. We've already seen now, especially in the previous slides, that there's some evidence that individual segments of these arterioles can seem to dilate independently. But the real question is, in order for laminar fMRI to work, we're going to need to have some control structures on these branches that come off of these principal arterioles as well. Potentially, even if there were some control structures around the capillaries, it would give us even finer spatial specificity. And the bottom line is that today it's still not really known whether or not there are mechanisms for such local blood flow regulation, especially mechanisms that persist across the entire brain. And now there's lots of studies with two photo microscopy that are trying to investigate new mechanisms for local blood flow control, but it's still very controversial. And I think the bottom line is that today we still not, do not know what the ultimate specificity of any hemodynamic based measure like fMRI might be. Now, even if there is local blood flow control that can give us laminar specific uh, blood flow responses, we need, still need to contend with the downstream hemodynamic effects. And so what I mean by this is that, say we have some neural activity in layer six, we're gonna see some local bold signal there, but because the bold signal, especially on the venous side, it's gonna kind of, the blood is gonna be draining up towards the peel surface, we're also gonna see a bold signal near layer four. So based on the observation of this bold signal, it might be ambiguous as to which cortical layer has been activated. And it gets more complicated if multiple layers are activated, we're gonna see some accumulation of this bolt signal. So recent work from the Donders group tried to kind of understand how this bolt signal would accumulate across cortical depths. They also modeled some laminar spread functions in order to account for the fact that if we get neural activity in any one given cortical layer, the bolt response is likely to spread across many cortical layers. So again, what they're showing here very nicely is that the bolt responses in upper layers are going to reflect, reflect an integrated response from all the lower layers as well, and this needs to be taken into account. Now, most of what I've been talking about so far is like laminar fMRI in the cortex, but people have been demonstrating laminar fMRI in layered structures outside of the cortex as well. For example, in the retina, the hippocampus, uh, olfactory bulb, which is a really interesting neurovascular coupling, uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, which has also really fascinating kind of microvascular density, as well as the superior colliculus. So it seems that, that by looking across the brain, it seems like there might be some general principles or very local blood flow regulation that can give rise to very high resolution fMRI responses that may also allow us to perform laminar fMRI in the cortex as well. Okay, so just a few words on the challenges in predicting neuronal responses. And here are two questions that I don't really know the answer to. So how do we design novel stimuli that are appropriate for fMRI that we know can induce top-down or bottom-up processing? There's a lot of complexities in stimulus design. Also, how do we know which cortical layers respond to our stimulus or task? The anatomical connections are often insufficient to predict these activation patterns. We know that these intercortical networks are nonlinear. So the idea is if we have some input coming into any given layer in a cortical area, in order for that input to have any effect on the local processing, it's gonna have to propagate outside of that layer. And maybe the fact that we could see peak neural activation that can occur out outside of that input cortical layer. So it's really tough to know which layers are gonna be activated in response to any given stimulus or task. This is nicely demonstrated by a pair of recent studies of top-down effects in the primary visual cortex. So this first study by Lars Muckley presented a stimuli and looked at a visual cortex in a region that was not stimulated, performed a classification task. And what they found was that the performance accuracy of this classifier peaked around layer one or maybe layer two, three. And they interpreted this as there's more information about top-down processing in these superficial layers. In another recent study from Peter Cockadall, uh, they used this classic Knizia triangle in order to induce illusory contours. If they saw any effects in V1, this would also be likely due to top-down effects. And they saw the strongest activation in the deep layers, which they also interpreted as a signature of some top-down processing. So there's a lot of differences between these analyses. There's a lot of differences between these stimulus designs. It, I think this, you know, again, both effects were attributable to a feedback pathway, but this sort of nicely highlights some of the complexities in these experimental designs and analysis. And finally, we know that there are many recurrent connections across the brain. Activity is really rapidly bouncing back and forth all throughout the network. We know that there's a direct projection, for example, from V1 to V2, and then V2 projects right back to V1. So at the time scales of fMRI, a feedback signal can easily find itself propagated onto a feedforward pathway, making it more challenging to infer which pathway we're looking at simply by looking at activity within any given cortical layer. Okay, so just to wrap up, so laminar fMRI is in principle very easy. All we need to do is sample fMRI across depths, but the differences in anatomy and microvasculature across layers makes the interpretation very difficult. We know that the layer positions shift across the folding pattern, although we have some techniques to account for this. 
we've seen that the hemodynamic response really varies across depths. It's coupled between layers. There's also these kind of asymmetric downstream effects we need to take into account. And it's also very difficult to predict functional responses across layers based purely on knowledge of anatomical connectivity. Uh, so again, I think that if we can address a lot of these challenges, I think there's still a lot of potential for laminar fMRI to teach us some new kind of fundamental insights into brain function. Okay, so I'd like to thank uh, Renzo for the animations, some members of the group for providing me with some materials, and of course, uh, thank you for your attention.